Have you ever wrestled with feelings of inadequacy? Have you ever felt like you weren't good enough? I have definitely wrestled with that in my lifetime, and I know that you have. It's a part of our human journey. In today's teaching, I want to say something to you. Well, actually, I want to tell you what Paul said. The fact is, we are not good enough. But because of God's grace, we are graced enough, even when we're not good enough. This is Bishop Lippman Live. In an ever-changing world, everybody needs a relationship with a never-changing God. Welcome to Bishop Lippman Live. Welcome to another episode of Bishop Lippman Live. If this is your first time viewing us, welcome aboard. And we want you to subscribe, to like, comment, and share, and be a part of the Bishop Littman Live family. By all means, to those of you who are already part of the family, welcome to another episode. It's always wonderful to share God's truths with you. Well, how many times have you felt inadequate, like you weren't good enough? We're dealing with difficult times as of this moment, where many of us are second-guessing all of the choices that we've made from our career choices to uh, our, our money and how to handle situations that have popped up and arisen in our lives that we never in a million years could have expected. And that can sometimes leave you feeling like you're not good enough, you're not smart enough, that you have maybe even wasted years in your life trying to juggle and balance life to just figure out one day to the next. And for many people, that is a very true reality right now. The Apostle Paul sort of deals with this. In our last episode, we talked about Paul's assessment of things and how he placed the value of the king above the things. Paul went through his accolades and the myriad of achievements and accomplishments that he had made as a Jew among Jews. I mean, he was in the top echelon of his entire faith community, religious community, and business community. Yet Paul says, I count all those things as nothing compared to knowing Jesus. And that's Paul's proper assessment of things. That's Philippians chapter 3, verse number 8. And I want to share with you today, though, from the bottom of verse number 8 to verse number 9 of Philippians chapter 3. And again, I'm so happy to have you here. By all means, if you're listening to the podcast, subscribe. If you're watching this on YouTube, subscribe. If you're catching me on Facebook, please be sure to leave a comment, like, and go and join the YouTube channel so that you'll get updates every time new content is loaded. This is amazing material that is blessing me. And I know from hearing from many of you that it is blessing you as well. Now, in Philippians chapter number three, verse number eight, let's go back and review. Paul says in the Living Bible translation, yes, everything else is worthless when compared with the priceless gain of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. I have put aside all else, counting it worthless, worth less than nothing in order that I can have Christ. Now, look at verse number nine. That was Paul's assessment of things. And Paul tells us that all of the great things he had achieved, acquired and accomplished they are worth less than knowing Christ. He's not saying that they're worthless, but they are worth far less than the great value and joy of knowing Jesus Christ. Now, that's his proper assessment of things. I want you to see, secondly, today, a proper assessment of thoughts. And that's what Paul gives us now in verse number nine. Let me pick up at the bottom of Philippians 3, verse number eight. Paul says, Put aside all else, counting it worth less than knowing, than nothing, in order that I can have Christ. Now, verse number nine. And become one with him. Here it is. Here it is. No longer counting on being saved by being good enough or by obeying God's law, but by trusting Christ to save me. God's way of making us right with himself depends on faith, counting on Christ alone. 
And verse nine is just amazing for so many reasons, because Paul says there, I want to become one with Christ and here's how I'm doing it. You see, let me back up just a minute as a Jew among Jews, as a Hebrew among Hebrews, as a part of the top echelon of the religious society of his time, Paul was one of those who was adamant about keeping the law and making sure everyone else did. You see, that's what made them stand out is that they were supposedly superb in the law and super superlative sainthood. And therefore, because they kept the law, they demanded that everyone else kept the law. The law simply means the law of Moses, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. In the book of Leviticus, for example, there are all kinds of stipulations and there are over 600 laws in those five books of the Bible. And so Paul helps us to understand uh, that uh, keeping the law and all of that was his daily routine. In fact, that was not only his ambition, it was his source of pride because it brought him tremendous clout in the religious community. But he says, all of that is no longer of value to me as it relates to knowing Jesus. Now he says in verse number nine, no longer counting on, this is the key word, no longer counting on being saved by being good enough. Now here's what Paul is saying. He is saying, that he has put aside this thought that if I'm good enough, God will accept me. Oh, doesn't that speak to us right now? Because many of us feel like we're not good enough to be accepted by people, let alone God. In fact, some of us don't even accept ourselves. We're critical of ourselves. We find fault with everything about us. We look in the mirror and everything is wrong with us. We can find so many different things to talk about that are negative towards ourselves. Paul says, I have changed my assessment of thoughts. I no longer look at myself as trying to be good enough to be saved or accepted by God. And what we need to understand is that we should have a proper assessment of thoughts that our thoughts have to be brought under control. Maybe you went through something in your life where you felt rejected or somehow manipulated, or maybe you've even gone through an even worse situation of divorce, or perhaps you've gone through molestation or some type of sibling things that you don't even want to talk about it. And it left you stained mentally and spiritually. Maybe you had a child and, and your family uh, ridiculed you because your child was born out of wedlock. Or maybe again, you've gone through divorce or two or three marriages and you feel that you're really not accepted. Now we can put on a good front <laughs> and pretend very well, but on the inside, it lies the truth. And we often see ourselves anticipate that people see us the way we see ourselves, especially that part that we don't talk about. And so we can feel as if we are not good enough for God, good enough for people, good enough to be loved, good enough to be accepted. But Paul says, I have a proper assessment of thoughts now post Christ, because I no longer depend on those things of my past to make me good enough for God. So let me give you some sub points under point number two. First of all, number one, Paul gives us his proper assessment of things in Philippians three and eight. And then in Philippians three, eight, the last part of the verse going into verse number nine, Paul gives us a proper assessment of thoughts, a proper assess assessment of things in verse eight, a proper assessment of thoughts in verse number nine. And here is the first thought that I want you to get today. My behavior is not what made me acceptable to God. 
My behavior is not what made me acceptable to God. Now, Paul begins verse number nine by saying, I'm no longer counting on being saved by being good enough. Now, what is Paul saying here? He's saying that he once thought that if he did everything right, if he did everything properly, if he did everything according to 600 laws that are found between Genesis and Deuteronomy, God would accept him. That if he brought lambs and all of that and burnt offerings and uh, brought all of that to a priest for the priest to absolve his sin, God would accept him. That if he joined the Lions Club and became uh, a part of this fraternity and that society, God would accept him. Now, Paul says, I realize that I need to have a proper assessment of my thought life because my behavior is not what made me acceptable to God. That is to say that me dotting every I and crossing every T is not what made me acceptable to God. You know why? Why that is true and why that is powerful is the fact that if our behavior is what made us acceptable God, to God, then what happens when our behavior doesn't look like the Savior? And see, that's why you cannot just extract a verse and make a doctrine out of it because then if you were to do it that way and think of it only in those terms, then that means that salvation can be lost and gained based upon your behavior. It means that God's love is fluid. God's love may not last long enough for you to say, I'm sorry. It, 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 it paints the image and the picture of a God who is sometimey and somewhat psychotic that he loves me today, but I messed up and made a mistake. Uh-oh, it's all gone. Mm -mm. Paul needs us to understand. I need you to understand that your behavior is not what made you acceptable to God. God looks way beyond our behavior. In fact, before we were born, he sent his son, Jesus, to die on Calvary's cross. So his love for us is not based on our behavior. Let's look at the second thing that Paul teaches us. And that is my busyness, not business, but busyness is not what made me acceptable to God. Where do you see that? Well, keep looking at verse number nine. He says, number one, and become one with him, no longer counting on being saved by being good enough. So that's my behavior. Here it is. Or by obeying God's law. Now, when Paul talks about obeying God's law, he is not saying that we should not obey God in order to make God happy. What he is saying is that we don't behave in order to be saved. We behave because we have been saved. And, and when Paul talks about obeying God's law, he's talking about as one of those Pharisaic Jews, one of those legalistic kind of people, because every day was about enforcing God's code. <laughs> and every day was about reminding people you're going to hell because you didn't do right. You went to the movies, you know, and he was busy going about trying to make sure other folk were doing what they were supposed to do. That's what he's talking about. We can be so busy doing church work that we actually neglect the work of the church. You see, Paul was religious, but not right. He was religious, but not truly righteous. And he was working hard every day, trying to please the God of the Old Testament. But your busyness is not what made you acceptable to God. 
In fact, in this time that we're sitting at home, most of us, we, we, we should really understand that now because we can't be busy. Church calendars have been filled to the brim and they still are. If we were acceptable to God based upon our activity and our busyness, where would that put us now? But thank God we are not accepted by God based upon our behavior, nor our busyness. Well, Paul teaches us this right here. My belief is what made me acceptable to God. My belief, not my behavior, not my busyness, but my belief is what made me acceptable to God. Look at verse nine again. Philippians chapter three, the living Bible translation. He says, becoming one with him, no longer counting on being saved or being good enough to be saved, being saved by being good enough, that's behavior, or by obeying God's law, that's busyness, but by trusting Christ to save me, that's belief. (laughs) Paul says, Now I really understand. Now I've had a proper assessment of things. Now I have a proper assessment of thoughts. And now I understand that it's merely my belief that makes me acceptable to God. He says, trust in Christ to save me for God's way of making us right with himself depends on Faith, counting on Christ alone. What it is that brings righteousness and right standing between us and God is very simple. Our belief in the Lord Jesus Christ, our confession of him. We are saved by grace through faith. And that not of ourselves, lest we should boast. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. Paul wrote those same words. Because he says to us in verse 7, if anybody could be saved by his works, by all means, I'm that dude. But it's not by busy lifestyles, program after program, Event after event, white suit after black suit. (laughs) It's not in all of that. It's all in our belief in the Lord Jesus Christ. And faith is what God uses to count us righteous. So my behavior does not make us acceptable to God. My busyness does not make us acceptable to God. But my belief is what makes me acceptable to God. I want you to rest your mind and wrap your mind around the fact that your behavior does not change how God sees you. You're going to fall sometimes. You're going to make some mistakes. You're going to make some boo-boos. But he still loves you the same. But all your mistakes are just a part of your story. It's fabric woven into your beautiful, rich story. All of the things that you've done wrong, God does not hold that against you. And don't feel like that you have to be doing something every single moment and speaking in tongues at least eight hours a day for God to accept you. He loves you as you are. And he sees the good in you because you're his child. He sees the God in you. Your belief in Jesus, your faith in his death, burial, resurrection, your acceptance of him as your savior, your repentance of your sin is what makes you acceptable to God. Last thing, and I'm closing. 
even if you're not acceptable to people, understand this. As long as you have the acceptance of God, nothing and no one else matters. You know why? Your destiny is not in the hands of men. It's in the hands of God. I want to pray with you right now. Father, I thank you so much for my friends who are viewing or listening to this episode. God, help us to get past our mistakes. Help us to get past how we see ourselves and even how others may see us and allow us to see ourselves through the eyes of grace to see ourselves as you do, as forgiven, as worthwhile, as lovable, as acceptable, as holy through the blood of Jesus, our Christ. And God, forgive us for all of our past and help us to forgive ourselves for our mistakes, to walk free from the penalty of our own judgment and in and, and, and the penalty of our own mistakes and past and thoughts about ourselves. Help us to see ourselves as we are, which is accepted by you because of your son, Jesus Christ. And we thank you now in Jesus name. Amen. Hey, friends, I love sharing these teachings with you. If you're interested in joining my E-class, I'd love to have you as a part of it. It's very simple, very quick. Just simply send an email to clearstudies at gmail.com. Clearstudies at gmail.com. And you don't have to put a long message. Just say sign me up or include me or whatever you want to say will be fine. Also, if you have a prayer request and you'd like for me to pray with you and pray for you. I'd be happy to do that. Simply send an email to prayerwithbishop at gmail.com. Again, prayerwithbishop at gmail.com. Well, the Lord bless and keep you. Remember, you are favored. You are accepted. You are worth the love that God gives to you. And God will never stop loving you. Remember, your behavior and your busyness don't make you acceptable to God, but your belief alone does because God uses your faith to perfect you. You're great. You're special. You're wonderful in the eyes of the Lord. You are the redeemed of God. I love you and God does as well. I look forward to sharing with you next time on Bishop Littman Live.